Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the World Drag Safety Congress webinar series. I'm really happy to have you here. Um, my name is Saman Sen, and I am the Business Development Manager for the event. And I'm very pleased to introduce today's session focusing on automating adverse event case processing through machine learning and innovation sponsored by Deloitte. Um, our moderator for the session today will be Glenn Carroll, uh, Principal Life Sciences Strategy, Leader of Safety and Medical Principles at Deloitte Consulting. Um, Glenn, I will hand it over to you. Uh, great, uh, thanks so much. Uh, very excited to share our progress that we've made with Sanofi on cognitive case processing. Um, as mentioned, my name is Glenn Carroll and I lead our safety and medical practice. I'm also joined on the call uh, by Amanda Bowles, who's the business lead uh, for Converge Health Safety. This is the platform that we're building cognitive case processing on. And then also from Sanofi, we have Steve Kusky, who's the global head of PB operations, and Anad Ramanathan, who's the head of digital global uh, PB. So over the next 60 minutes, uh, we will share with you our vision of safety for the future, uh, the platform that we're building to achieve this vision. I'll then hand you over to Sanofi uh, to talk about the Artemis program, how it works, uh, and the journey we've been on um, in this program. We'll then get into some of the details on data science, uh, its evolution through the program, and the controls that we've put in place. We'll then share some in-production metrics, uh, the business impact that we've been able to achieve um, as part of the program, and we'll also talk about some, some uh, next steps and next release. And then finally, we'll, we'll end with lessons learned. Uh, I'll monitor, I will monitor uh, the chat box for questions, and so we're happy to take questions throughout, and we'll also take questions at the end. So with that, I did want to pull up a, a first poll um, can we just pull that up, please? So what type of organization best aligns uh, to your company? Um, so select all that applies. So are you uh, uh, representing a biopharma company, a professional services company, a regulator, or others? So please go ahead and vote. Great, okay, so it looks like the majority, uh, close to 60%, uh, work at Biopharma, then we have a good representation of uh, professional services, and we have we have about 15% of other. Um, that's very helpful. Uh, we have another uh, quick poll uh, that we're gonna do, and then we'll get into the meat of the, the conversation. Can we, can we pull up the next poll, please? So this is, where in the journey uh, are you on safety automation? Uh, and so um, the, uh, the options are initial planning stages, uh, completed a business case, performed uh, a proof of concept study in production with some level of automation or on an end-to-end -end automation journey to fully automate uh, case processing. Okay, so it seems like close to half folks uh, are in initial planning stages, so early in the journey. A uh, small percentage have completed a business case and or performed proof of concept. And then it's great to see that, you know, good per, uh, percentage, uh, a little over 40%, have some level of automation uh, in place and then a smaller percentage that are on a, a full end-to-end -end journey. This is very helpful because it, it, it helps us sort of point the conversation um, in, in the direction of, of what this profile looks like. Uh, great, okay, so I, I think we will then move forward and, and let's get into uh, the actual uh, meat of the, the conversation. So um, our journey in transforming uh, safety started about seven years ago. Uh, all of the existing trends, those of us who've spent a significant amount of time in safety understand only too well, they continue to happen. 
uh, increasing case volumes, increasing regulatory complexity, new sources of safety information, availability of social media, real-world evidence that needed to be evaluated. And, and we saw all of these trends continuing to occur, and still there was fairly limited in, in innovation um, by traditional technology providers uh, in that time period and, and stretching back, you know, even further 10, 15 years. But what we saw was with the increasing availability of advanced analytics and data science, we actually saw a massive opportunity for pharma and for PD organizations to do things differently, uh, to do things that uh, candidly had never been done before and, and do it in a very thoughtful manner. And, and essentially by leveraging AI and ML, we thought we could automate the commodity side of, of drug safety and free up human capital resources to focus on the PD insights and gain deeper uh, understanding of benefit risk. And, and so shifting uh, from uh, patient safety being reactive, manual and, and task focused to that focus on benefit risk, taking a patient centric approach and driving disproportionate productivity and quality improvements. So essentially, we then uh, we, we created a future vision of safety. So if we just go over the uh, over the page, can we go to the next page? Perfect. Um, so we came with this uh, this vision, and and we basically focused it around three major areas within PD. Starting with case processing, we thought end to end cognitive case processing could be achieved where basically the machines would do the majority of the work and when the machines could not process the case it would go to an expert uh, user for targeted review the quality of the case would be improved and we would see disproportionate uh, productivity improvements um, and essentially the hope would be that traditional uh, databases would be eliminated leveraging the learnings and the ai and ml technology from the end-to-end -end case processing you could then apply those same algorithms to smart signal, whereby patterns and trends could be intelligently and automatically identified, evaluated, and adjudicated. And then finally, leveraging the insights and learnings from smart signal and cognitive case processing, you could create real-time dynamic reports that would automatically be ordered and any exceptions or insights would be managed and evaluated by an expert reviewer obviously a dramatic shift from how traditional um, uh, safety was, was being done and is being done. And all of this we thought could be achieved in a single innovative safety platform. And so based on this, um, this uh, kind of vision that we created seven years ago, we began to create our safety platform. Let me hand you over to Amanda. She's gonna talk a little bit about our platform. Great, thanks, Glenn. Before we leave this slide, I just want to point out, as, as Glenn was alluding to, um, there, there's underlying power, if you will, in a platform because what the power is there, is, as Glenn just mentioned, is, is this mass source of safety data. And there's a real opportunity across the PV lifecycle from case processing to aggregate reporting to signaling to leverage that data because it's the same data that shows up um, across all three areas within the within the life cycle and leverage the investments um, and take advantage of the learning that that's taking place. So for example, um, if a case appears in case processing, that case needs to be medically reviewed. And so there's learning and there's data that inform that medical review decision. Well, that same type of case will also then show up um, you know, in a quarterly signal case series review or potential in the aggregate report on a yearly basis. And so there's a power in being able to um, really um, take the investments that are there in any area of the life cycle and, and drive learning and drive intelligence um, throughout. So if we go to the next slide. As Glenn mentioned, all of these pieces kind of came together and we worked um, quite extensively with the industry starting about five years ago to, to, to build out our convertible safety platform to begin to achieve this vision and drive to this vision. So it does have modular capabilities across typical like um, safety capabilities that you would typically see in a safety organization. But again, underlying all of this is a single platform and with a single way for users to interact with data to take advantage of um, algorithm learnings, to take advantage of 
the efficiencies that can be gained when you look at, at, at safety holistically. And so we were very lucky um, as we started to go through the automation case processing journey that um, and very privileged to, to, to be aligned with our partner Sanofi um, and bringing this vision to reality. And I think now I'll turn it over to Steve, who's going to talk about how, um, you know, the marrying of forces, if you will, with, with the vision that, that Deloitte had through working with the industry, but also that Sanofi um, had as a result of, of some of the tactical challenges you were facing. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Glenn. Next page, please. Give you an overview of the program. I, I think uh, I think we uh, I think I've talked to this slide. This slide really talks about where um, and I guess Anand and I really began the, this journey. It's from Sanofi's perspective, really dealing with the fact that I think everybody on this call knows that there's just an exponential growth in data in, in the in the in, in the safety data and uh, available safety data. Um, and then as Glenn and, and Amanda were talking about the evolving data science capabilities, um, the opportunities became obvious at Sanofi that we had to do, we, we had the opportunity to do something different for a change around case processing, a, a process that's probably been uh, routine and same for probably two decades. Um, and we had a way to do it that was going to allow us to really give Sanofi the opportunity to put its resources more focus and focus those resources more on enhanced patient safety uh, than on doing what I would call or what I, what I think all of us would call routine case processing. And so for the challenge for us at, at Sanofi is we receive approximately around 600 uh, in 2019, for example, we received around 690,000 adverse event cases. Um, it's growing, the, the volume keeps growing 5 to 20% a year, um, and 99% of our work is done by vendors in India. Um, it's a substantial cost for case basis, even though we have a pretty good aggressive pricing, it's still a lot of money. And the quality is often very sporadic and difficult to improve. Uh, turnover at the vendors, and just the fact that I think we all know that someone, uh, you could have a very good good pharmacist or a very good uh, physician do a case on Monday and get the same case on Friday and do that case differently and come to a different conclusion. And that level of inconsistency was just, is, is always just difficult to overcome. Um, so we began an RFP back in actually uh, 20, uh, 2018, I believe, right on, I think it was 2018. And uh, to look for a partner to work with us to, uh, um, uh, build a solution for this or to, to work and develop a solution for our particular issue around case processing. And we selected Deloitte um, and it's been a multi-year partnership and it's a joint initiative. Um, we kicked it off in October of 2018 and, um, and again, like I said, to optimize single case processing. Um, we took a phased approach. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And we also made sure we actively engaged with our uh, health, health authorities, um, such as the ANSM, which is the uh, French Health Authority, FDA, EMA, and MHRA. Um, and again, our goal was improve data quality, enhance compliance through automation, through speed and automation, and again, optimizing our resources to make sure we could, uh, we could use those resources for a better understanding of our safety profiles. Um, as opposed to routine case processing. Next slide, please. One more, please, thanks. So I, I think I wanna start here because uh, I think uh, if people are in pharmacovigilance, they'll, they'll know this, but there might be people who are not. So I just wanted to start with uh, what I would call the traditional case processing flow. And I would think almost everybody follows something similar to this. So you receive a case that might come in electronically, it might be paper, um, someone has to then book that case into the system. Um, so it's actually in the system that's usually entering a few initial you know, six, or, six or so pieces of information so the case can be identified and prioritized. Uh, data entry, um, just what it sounds like, entering the case, getting that case in the system. Somebody that has to assess that case, quality control, do quality control. Somebody has to medically review that case, and that's usually a physician. Um, and then that case has to be distributed, closed, uh, so that it can be reported and distributed to health authorities and, and any of our licensed partners or um, other, other uh, places we need to report that data to. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. It's very linear. Um, I guess the other point up here is, and it's kind of relevant, is the user vigilance triage. We we're required to download cases, uh, our cases that we don't have from the EV user vigilance database. 
Um, this is a very painful and challenging process and definitely a great target for automation. Um, next slide, please. So what does Artemis do? And I think this is really what we wanted to start with is like, how is Artemis working? So I didn't, I didn't mention, we, you know, uh, Sanofi uses a standard Argus database, um, up-to-date new, new database. Um, and so think of Artemis, PV Artemis sitting on top of that database um, and allowing us to bypass that case receipt, that bookend, and that data entry uh, components of our linear process. Um, for the initial release one, all we, we were focused on PSB cases, so patient support programs, um, coming in on a form. And Artemis extracted the information off that form, used natural learning processing and machine learning uh, to enter that case into Artemis, followed by an exception review process quality control, quality QC, an inline QC process, to then populate our Argus database in the case assessment phase. Um, we went through then a reduced QC in, the, in our system, medical review and distribution. So again, we're receiving cases from mail or fax. With release two, we've expanded that. We'll talk more about that too. So that we're receiving cases from mail, uh, fax, case entry interface, E2B, um, other select documents coming in connections with uh, global, our global medical information group, sending a cases E2B to us. So now with release two, it's, it's much more expanded. Um, but we also, I just want to point out, we also have a lot of uh, additional controls. We have retrospective data quality assurance, and we were, we're maintaining KPIs and metric reports on the results of, of what Artemis is doing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. So next slide, please. So what it was, again, I've preferred a little bit of our automation journey starting in, um, in 2018. Um, again, I talked a little about re release one, the scope, patient support programs, uh, case intake and entry, and user vigilance cases. I didn't mention that. We thought we saw that as a great opportunity uh, to really um, to, to start with and really would work with release one, which was essentially a prototype. And as I, as I said before, release two, we expanded that to almost all our cases. Um, we added expanded extraction, uh, increase in uh, natural learning, and, and increase in natural and machine learning as well. Um, our, I guess I said our, uh, phase one was, uh, um, as you can see, uh, we released early in 2020. Um, and I'll talk more, again, I'll talk more about the results there. And we, uh, one year later in 2021, in January, we just, uh, we completed successfully release two. Um, we are looking at, a, uh, we are beginning to work on release three. Um, this will be additional automation, automation functionality, including AI translation um, and additional case volume. So again, we're, man we're working with Deloitte and partnering. I think this is a great example of how we've partnered together. We we're mitigating the risk by taking a staged approach. And I don't know, Anand, do you want any comments yeah. on that? So yes, yeah, to, to add to what you're saying, Steve, one of the key parts that we have implemented, as you see on the slide, is uh, today we have a repetitive manual process. Tomorrow we are having automation capabilities in place, but one of the most important things uh, as a success factor for us is the human oversight that we are implementing as well. That will help us uh, refine the automation pieces, the algorithms, the data science models, et cetera, to make it more efficient as we go along regularly as part of monitoring we'll discuss in the coming slides as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you, Aaron. Next slide, please. Yeah. So segue to the data science. So. As Steve mentioned, um, just to touch on the journey itself, the journey itself has been quite uh, exciting. We started the journey literally quite early. Uh, we had, and uh, during the implementation of our uh, traditional safety database that we have in Arcus, and towards the end of the journey, we said, okay, so we have a fork in front of us. We can either keep going the way we are going and keep adding on resources to process the cases, or we can put in some automation uh, face the challenges that come with automation, of course, and then the journey would be much better for us and be more efficient, we'll have more quality, and we chose the path uh, of choosing automation on top of the safety database. So, and the excitement from team 
is literally through the roof. I mean, that's one of the key success factors. The excitement for the team that has just implemented a, a long-term safety database and on top of that working on this new technology, new skills that need to be maintained uh, are all success factors for this so far for us with R1 and R2. So to touch on the data science piece of the uh, puzzle, uh, which is one of the crucial things, one of our goals is to try to do as much as possible automation through data science. And of course, at the same time, balance to a certain extent and not go crazy of everything going automation and, uh, and, and putting us in more of a, a challenge of understanding everything. So we had to take a step-by-step -step approach, which we did with R1 and R2, as Steve alluded to in, the, in our faces. So in the release one for data science, uh, as PSP, one of the examples that you show, see on the slide is we separated the PSP form that we have into two halves. One is the structured fields that we have, and the other one is unstructured fields, a pure narrative, for example. So what we had to do is take the two data sets and go through the iteration of training, testing, and validation. So multiple times uh, in the process to ensure we are actually able to get to a point that we get good accuracy scores of the outcome of that process, uh, which is what we did. And for us to be doing that using the data that we have in, in, uh, in the Argus database helped us even more because we had just migrated the data uh, we have been processing the data in Argus in the new system, and then it was it was quite helpful, not simple, but it was helpful that we had the data and for us to go through this process, which allowed us to set this up as a good foundation for us to jump on to release two, where we added on more functionality, whether it's E2B intake across the board, uh, whether it is duplicate check, uh, or we also set up a case portal for data entry from, from various sources who want to enter data into Sanofi. So one of the other things that we also found and added as part of this transition from R1 and R2 is the findings, the monitoring, et cetera, that we have set up in R1 enabled us to identify additional data science upgrades that we had to do. We had to put in additional ontologies uh, and create more specialized models that help us with certain key entities, as we call it, or attributes, um, uh, or data labels that we in, to simplify in order to make it much more efficient uh, when we go through R2 and which we have seen quite quite a success as well. Next slide, please. So here is a quick view without going through all the details. Uh, we do have a method to our madness of data science and this is generally universal. However, we may have some specific tweaks to it to ensure we are pretty comfortable because Sanofi, we are going first time into this kind of automation and pharmacovigilance, as we all know, it's highly regulated. So we wanted to be careful step-by-step -step process. So here is an example for data science approach that we take. So obviously if it is a form, for example, any data that is coming into, or any AE that is coming into us, we'll have to first ingest that. We should be able to ingest that using some kind of uh, approach, whichever the approach we are taking, multiple approaches, whether it's PDF, whether it's email or other forms. Then OCR is an example that we use to separate the data out. Then we have to tag the data. So once we tag the data, we will know which one to use, which kind of attributes to use, which kind of matches that we need to use without going into details. And then the model itself, we need to figure out which model works best for which data or which attribute or which entity. And then based on that, the outcome of that, the human oversight that we have in place, we'll have the opportunity to tune, tune that model whichever way we want to tune it based on the outcomes. Then comes sedation. So once we go through the sedation engine for the model and the scoring for the model, we decide which model to use for which attribute. So at a simple high level view, there is this method that we follow to ensure every model is picking up what we are expecting to pick up. And there is full transparency that we are actively involved in the development of the model, in the outcome, in the monitoring of the model itself. Next slide, please. Now, speaking of controls, we have a lot of controls in place. Uh, there's a lot of text in here, but to simplify it, let's separate it into two halves, the half left and the right half. The left half is usually what we do in terms of all GXP solutions, which is to ensure we have proper business process activity and also the QMS in place, proper deviation management in place, audit trail in place, and part 11 compliance in place. So that is a default for all GXP activities and PV being one of the key regulated area. What we had to do in addition to the default activities is shown on the right. In addition to the default ones, we also had to do some retrospective QA for this. 
we have to go back and check the manually entered data and also the model outcomes to ensure we are going in the right path and tune the model if we need to tune the model based on those outcomes. In addition to that, the models have to be absolutely transparent. We can't have a black box sitting in there and not know what the model is doing, and then we just wait for the outcome. Uh, that's not the way we want to do. So we want to ensure all of us in the team are completely involved in how the model is set up, what kind of algorithm is entered, what kind of balance with business rules is tackled in here in order to ensure the transparency is absolutely secure in here. Thirdly, there is continuous monitoring. So model has exceptions, human oversight creates exceptions as well. All of those have to be flagged, tracked every few months or so to ensure we collect the data, we analyze the data, and we go through the same test, train, refine process that I'll just talk about in the next slide. Finally, validation quality checks, which is also quite important in this kind of automation that we are implementing. We need to ensure at every stage of this initiative, every stage of each model, we have proper quality check in place, lifecycle, not only in the project, but also after the project is completed. Next slide, please. Here's an example of how we are trying to ensure there is well transparency, good transparency in the model development and also refinement of the model itself. Again, there is also a method to this madness. Uh, I'm sure all of you who have stated that you're already in the process uh, are aware of this. Uh, we have to train the model. We have to measure the outcome. We have to refine the model based on the outcome itself. Then we deploy and then we do monitoring on that. So these are the five steps we follow in simple for every model, for every attribute that the model is actually used to actually determine something, so to automate something. And this has helped us quite a bit, especially the monitoring piece and also the refinement piece and the human oversight that we talked about, because which is very important in the initial stages. That's what gives us the exceptions. That's what allows us to tell us which model needs to be refined and how it needs to be refined with the balance of business rules itself. Next slide, please. Now, so we have the initial model training, we go through the controls in place, but if we don't do the proper follow through on the model after something goes live, we're not going to get anywhere. So we're gonna stuck, be stuck with a model that is performing as it's performing, but not be able to improve. And this is where the continuous performance oversight comes into picture, where if you see the key buckets of this process, it's the same thing as the original model training, except we will have two pieces of information, which is the human oversight in some information, and also the exceptions that are generated by the model itself. So the combination of these two help us further refine this model much more as we go along every few months, but we do have to wait a few months, uh, every three months or so for us to get this to a good state, otherwise we'll be ending up with false negatives or false positives, which we don't want to get at. So it's important for us, and we, this is what is also another success factor, which is to continuously monitor the model, its performance, and the oversight feedback provided by the users itself. Next slide, I think I'm transferring back to Steve. Yep, I think I'm back. <clears throat> so again, like it's not, and as, as Anand talked about it, that you know, there's a lot of what we call system over oversight system controls, but there are business controls too. Um, and I think one of the key ones I'd start with is user adjudication. And uh, Anand alluded to this, and I think a little, I did a little bit on that first slide is that the that Artemis asks the user to adjudicate when it is uncertain about the results. So the Artemis user is presented with field level adjudication decisions. Um, that allow for this human oversight that we're talking about. If the if the AI or the the, uh, the algorithm is unsure of the result, um, it asks the human or has uh, co uh, contradictory information. The human must evaluate, and the human makes that decision. And as uh, as Anand just so aptly put, it is then saved, and we know and. The human says why they made that decision. Why why did the human override the machine, especially if the human override the machine? We want to know why. And then uh, that reason is selected by this human uh, who's doing the review. Um, then to top it off, we have inline quality control. And right now we're doing 100% of everything that's done through the machine is reviewed in inline QC. That sounds like a lot of work, but actually, Artemis is pretty streamlined, and that can be done fairly quickly and fairly easily. 
um, and it doesn't. And while it has an impact on some of our savings, it's still um, until we get more comfortable with the machine, until we are sure we know everything, we're going to continue doing inline quality control at 100%. Um, and then finally. Like any good system and any good quality system, we have retrospective quality insurance um, where cases are randomly sampled and there's a retrospective QA done on those cases. And then finally, uh, and that, um, not least uh, but last, KPI and metric reports. Um, we, the algorithm will be measured against the key performance indicators and metric reports that are constantly analyzed um, and help us understand our work better, understand how the machine works, um, and as a real key part of our ability uh, to, to manage and do oversight. Next slide, please. So this is a give you an idea where we are. So um, when we released, um, we've been able to move to greater and greater volumes in, in, um, in Artemis um, and uh, as we continue to provide ongoing training for the data science models. Um, where are we now? So when we went live in 2020 with release one, we processed approximately 210,000 cases in 2020 went through release one. Um, and people are asking, and I'll talk a little more about the, this, uh, the impact of that. Um, already with release two going live in Jan mid January of 2021, we've already in just two and a half months done 126,000 case versions through the system in the first two and a half months. Um, our portal being the largest volume source as well, which has been a real success for the portal. Um, as you can see on the, on the uh, right here, just to give you an idea of where the cases are coming from and where our sources, you can see the blue at the bottom is our portal. Uh, the orange in the middle are, are um, E2B cases coming from our uh, global medical uh, information vendor, um, followed up by um, uh, clinical cases coming in from our R&D groups. So again, a huge amount of diverse volume. We've gone from the first, uh, our first iteration of release one from just PSV cases. We've gone all the way to really getting almost every type of case type we, we, we receive through the through um, through Artemis now. It's 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 almost a hundred percent. Next slide, please. And I guess the question is, what does that mean, and how do we get savings from this? And the key thing here is keep um. It's, it's really through time, the time the vendor needs to spend or a, a pharmacist or a or physician needs to spend working on a case. Um, and you can see, um, even when a case is not fully automated, we, we're seeing significant savings. What you see in the below in the bar um, and the, on the left side is evalu uh, um, the, the evaluation that we talked about. As you can see, for different, for different types of cases. So for uh, a case coming in for um, global medical information, you can see right there, GMI, you can see about approximately the blue bar being our traditional data entry approach through outside of Artemis, and the orange being Artemis, a case received to Artemis. You can see for most of these cases, we cut the time in half. Um, and I could tell you that correspondingly, we've been able to negotiate the corresponding kind of savings from our vendors because we've cut the time, we've just cut the time in half. Now it's not perfect. You can see CIOMS is um, probably not the most uh, spectacular result there, but that's because we haven't focused on it as much. And that's part of our enhancements we'll be working on this year is to really improve the ability of how the CIOMS goes through all of this. What we did is we were strategic and you can see the green dots there we focused on the cases where we got the most volume first. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to be able to um, uh, make the biggest strategic impact we could. So we, we put all our effort with Deloitte, working with Deloitte to really make sure the cases that we got the most of, we had the most uh, efficiency. Um, again, on the, the right side, what you're seeing there is you're just seeing basically the same kind of graph for the inline QC. Uh, for QCing it, um, it's a significant reduction in time. Um, whereas you can see, and just generally, sometimes they're only spending uh, one to two minutes eva on evaluation of a case, and sometimes only three to six minutes doing the QC of a case. That's a huge amount of savings. Now, is there still a lot of work, work that has to be done when it gets to the Argus database? Absolutely. 
But still, if you can imagine the time savings, how effective that is. Next slide, please. And here's, I think, we've talked, I've just talked about efficiency. I think this is, this is probably the slide that makes me the happiest. It's what is the impact on quality? And, and it's, it's really been stunning, to be frankly. Um, there's over 50% fewer findings per case from a case that goes through Artemis than on average. The machine is just a lot more consistent than a human being. Um, it makes consistent decisions. Um, as you can see, we've dropped um, uh, pretty much and when January we went live with the first, uh, with release one, you can see we had 2.9 um, findings per case, dropped to two. By February, it had dropped to only 1.2 findings per case. Um, this is QC now, not, not QA, but QC. Um, and we're consistently looking as of July of 2020, you can see that's dropped. Uh, it's uh, you have 3.4 3 in a case that went through its normal process down to a little over one. So huge findings. And by the way, I can tell you that this is we're, we're, we haven't really kind of released the data for um, uh, release two, but but preliminary data show the same sort of sort of um, um, effect that we're seeing with release two, and just on a broader broader array of cases. Um, and again, you can see again here we're showing uh, the next slide on the right shows the same thing, average percentage of cases with no findings. So what you're seeing here is that only in 11% of our cases outside of Artemis would we have a case that we didn't find a finding on. Um, whereas 45% of the cases, if we just looked at the Artemis fields, 45% of those cases that went through Artemis had no findings on an Artemis field. Now they might have a finding when they got into the Ar Argus system and somebody might have made a mistake there. Um, but within the case, the, the fields strictly in Artemis, 45% um, of them had no, no error. And I can tell you most of them, when we did have an error, it was often about the drug, drug product, just because somebody might have put something in the narrative that was different than, than in, in, the, in the field. Sometimes uh, and we have some fairly complicated CHC products um, that, that can make that difficult and challenging. Um, so again, we're getting the best of both worlds. We're getting, uh, we're optimizing our efficiency while improving quality. And that has been something that I think a lot of people in the industry have been trying to do. And I, I think for the first time, I feel like we're actually achieving that. So it's very exciting. Next slide, please. So I kind of alluded on the business impact. And, um, and there's a lot of anticipated impacts we had on the business process, simplification of the cases, simplification of the forms to collect it, but there are a lot of unanticipated impacts too. Um, our case documentation process or case follow-up process has been simplified. Um, uh, review of data entry conventions for clinical cases um, have been simplified. Um, we uh, need to assess the work assignments with case management. It, the work is much more streamlined just in terms of how we work in the system. With our vendors, we had anticipated impacts. Um, repricing negotiations were key to this because we had to convince our vendors that they were gonna see improvements in time and savings. Um, so, so partnering with our vendors have been, have been critical. Um, we had to convince them that they were gonna free up resources for more complicated, it's, it's allowed us to free up resources for more complex cases. Um, and we've had unanticipated impacts. Um, we've had uh, um, multiple interact vendor interactions as well too on this. Um, change management has been a key part of this. Vendor and case management team engagement, um, affiliate engagement, um, and just, uh, and Anand said this, just general the excitement of the team about working on Artemis, even with the people who um, and our affiliates uh, have been excited and enthused by this. So it's been very excited that way. And then obviously, you know, the business impact, you know, we're, we're we, uh, you know, talking with the EMA, FDA, NSM, and MHA are, are critical thing, are critical um, activities that we need to, we've done and we need to continue doing. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, sharing this with uh, people in the industry is also a, a great opportunity from, from my perspective. Um, Steve, Steve, may, yeah. may I come in? Uh, we, we have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. I want to take. Um, so the first one is, can you please elaborate on automation or changes that have been made in medical review processing, including causality assessment, if any? Yeah, we haven't quite got there yet. 
Um, so I, I, as you, as I think we've alluded, most of our activity has been mostly on streamlining the intake and the data entry and then applying, obviously applying AI to how we collect that information. Um, but no, we have not got to the point where we're actually trying to uh, use AI to assess causality. That is something we're looking at as part of release three. Yeah, no, th thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we've been able to get up to, to, to QC through data entry to QC. And then as you mentioned, causality assessment, medical review, uh, submission uh, will be in uh, release three. Yeah. Uh, another question, what is the difference between PV Artemis and, and Arga safety case processing? Um, Amanda, do you want to take that? Sure, and maybe this is a good opportunity to, so just to be clear, the PV Artemis program that we've been speaking of, that's the Sanofi's branded name for this program, which is leveraging the Deloitte Converge Health Safety Platform that I that I mentioned before. But, be, but essentially, the PV Artemis program with Converge Health Safety has is the the case processing cognitive autom intelligent automation um, algorithms, the data science, um, the the ways of um, bringing in data in new ways. So it's essentially the automation platform, as as Steve uh, described in his business process overview. Um, PV Artemis or, or Converge Health Safety sits on top of the existing safety database. And I'm seeing another question in the chat. Um, it doesn't have to be Argus. We don't we don't really care. Um, Sanofi, obviously, as Steve said, had just or on in this apologies, had just gone live with an upgraded Argus um, version 8x um, in 2018. So uh, it doesn't have to be that, but it, it sits on top to drive automation to eliminate um, quite a bit of work up front. Great, thanks. You've got two questions there. I'll I'll just ask one a couple more. And then we'll go to, uh, we'll continue. So next question is how AI model helps to extract information uh, from literature sources? Again, that was, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, and it was, uh, and Glenn's laughing because it was, and so is Anon, because it was one of our first ideas as a prototype to look into that. Um, um, however, that area is uh, highly complex, less so about the data I mean, can AI do it? Absolutely. And, and were we very interested in lo looking at that? Um, I, I think the challenge is that there's a number of IP issues and additional um, players in that area. I think anybody's worked on literature search know uh, that made it um, highly complex for other reasons uh, that we decided that it wasn't where we were going to start. And so um, that was, our, again, our original use case. But uh, can it do it? Absolutely can do it. Um, and I think, you know, we'll be looking uh, more how to do that in uh, release three, definitely. Perfect. I'll ask two more questions and then I'll, we'll, we'll get through the rest of it and then I'll bring back questions. So um, next question, how many Artemis fields are there? Oh, that's a good one. It's about 80, isn't it, Amanda? It's even more. So it's, it's it, I think we referenced 35 earlier. That's where we started in release one. Um, but it's over 200 plus. So basically any field that we would capture from source, whether it's E2, V, R2, R3, um, and we also share information via R3. So if you can imagine the universe of E2, V, R3 plus the additional, you know, typical case processing fields we would need to capture for safety information. Perfect. And then one more question, and then we'll get back to this and I'll return to the questions. Could you speak about the 100% QC, Steve, and, and if and how you plan to reduce that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I think, um, so it, it, Art, Artemis, and I, we probably should have included a demo in this, but Artemis has, um, one, of the, one of the benefits of, uh, of, of, in Artemis is the ease of use and the way the data is presented. So uh, I didn't talk about this in, that, in the, when they're doing an evaluation review, when the machine's asking you, it's giving you, what it thinks the right answer on one side of the screen and it's giving you the source document that it's using on the other side of the screen. So it's very intuitive for the user to make that decision. The same thing when they go through QC, inline QC, they're seeing the fields, they're reviewing the fields, but they're also seeing the source document and how that information, that, that information was extracted. So a person is doing very easily making a review of all that data. Um, again, it's a, you know, it's, it's a trained uh, HCP doing that, but looking at it and making sure that the data was correct and things in line. We are looking at when we have noticed patterns in where, where we do see mistakes. 
Um, and we definitely see some fields that have, uh, we see more mistakes than others. Um, and I think as we get more comfortable with that, we're starting to look at like, um, and as we get through and continue to optimize the use of release two, we'll, we'll start to consider possibilities of making more uh, strategic or targeted inline QC. But right now, I think again, um, as we learn about the system, we're gonna probably stick with the full 100% QC for a little while. Perfect, thanks Steve. Okay, let's 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 continue with the presentation, and I'll I'll bring back some questions in a little bit. Great. So next slide, please. So again, we talked about cost savings drivers, and of course, quality is important, but so is um, getting ourselves out of an untenable constant growth um, situation. And so we had a lot of negative. Uh, it was a very challenging year, needless to say, 2020 to go live with, a, with the new release. Um, and so there was a lot of negative business factors we had to deal with. So 2020 case volume was down about 23% due to COVID initially. Um, and uh, um, you know our business model was dependent on a certain case volume. Um, we had a divestures of certain products uh, that also happened in 20, early in 2020 that impacted our case volume. And uh, so basically there were fewer, fewer fully automated cases than we initially anticipated. Um, but I have, personally have a great team and they're clever and they're flexible and they're flexible thinkers um, and they're very vested in the system and they came overcame a lot of those with just some agil agility and uh, um, flexibility of the system um, by finding other ways to get cases that we didn't anticipate, case types didn't anticipate get into the system. So for example, what did they do? Um, uh, so semi-automated cases were just, we were able to drive higher anticipated savings uh, basically by putting unplanned cases. So we found out COVID cases. We had a number of products looking at uh, COVID. Um, we, had, we ended up asking people who were collecting those cases to use our PSP form. Um, and we were able to push those cases through RMS, even though that was not part of the original plan or business case. Legal cases was another great opportunity. We were able to get those legal cases put onto those PSP forms and we're able to push those through. That added up to a huge amount of volume we were able to put through RMS that we never planned. Um, and as a result, we were able to actually um, exceed our savings by double. Um, our plan savings were actually doubled because of that. And again, because aggressive pricing strategy and I would, to be fair, uh, a collaborative partnership with our vendors who are willing willing to to sign on and work with us on that. So again, um, the release one, we 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 du doubled our expectations, and um, while preliminary, release two is definitely on target uh, to achieve its business case, which is um, significantly higher than uh, release one. That's great. So next slide, please. So I think this is still mine. Um, release three is, um, again, we, uh, we, we, this is our roadmap um, and we've come a good bit down the road and we're looking at release three, which is additional automation functionality, um, enhanced data science and machine learning to further increase those efficiencies and, uh, and really to promote targeted human reviews. And I think that's the key thing. We don't really envision a human being out of the picture, but really getting the human where they need to be in that case, where the human excels. Um, and, and trying to get the machine to really optimize on the rote, uh, consistent work where it excels. Um, again, we wanna improve data quality and compliance with each uh, increased, uh, with increased standardization, which is again, what the machine excels at. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're looking at how do we, uh, what's our ability to drive meaningful insights uh, from the data. Now, um, you know, basically, and Amanda likes to say this, the machine doesn't work in a linear fashion. And that gives us opportunities that we're just starting to understand. We don't have it all figured out yet, but the machine is aware of data and it gives us the opportunity to, one, prioritize cases differently than we ever did. Um, and two, notify us. Maybe, you know, what's the possibility the machine can tell us information before even a human being has looked at a case? Um, these are the kind of things we're looking at exploring with release three, and it's very exciting. I don't know, does anybody else want to add anything? You're pretty good at this, Amanda. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was kind of felt goes into I think that what the next slide is, but I, I also want to say that some of the success, successes that you just outlined, Steve, as well as the you know, where we're taking release three. Um 
a lot of a lot of that is because you know collectively between the Deloitte and Sanofi teams, we see this as it's technology achieving a business outcome, right? And there's a lot that goes into it. So there's like business innovation and reimagination of making a mess, right? Thinking of new ways of, of working, um, being willing to be creative on and thinking of ways that the controls still fit within the QMS of the organization, but um, still, you know, are protected from a compliance standpoint. So I just want to highlight that too, that that's been a, a core, you know, piece of not only the success achieved so far, but also how we're able to push the thinking going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. It's it's not just a tool. It's it's a holistic approach. Yeah, I think that kind of I think it's actually that's, ties. That's, that's a perfect <laughs> segue to my slide. Uh, if we can just uh, scoot forward to to lessons learned. I mean, but before I before I touch on this, um, I mean, what I would say is we've been able to achieve so much success with Sanofi because we go into it collectively together to think about all of the different use cases um, that's possible in, in the end-to-end -end process. And what we've done is we haven't sold for 100% of the automation, yeah, and then, and then therefore had to use an endless amount of resources. We've been very thoughtful and selective to basically say, look, we can point our algorithms and our technology to you know, sort of 90, 95%, and we can do that with a with a manageable set of resources. And so, you know, I think as we've approached this, Steve, we've we've always and on it, we've always been very thoughtful about what is the best bang for buck. And if we need to switch gears, which we did at the start on on literature because of you know some of the other challenges we had with IP. And then when we looked at the business case, it just wasn't that um I mean, it, it you know it, it wasn't that exciting relative to what we've achieved, uh, you know, having having you know kind of looked at other use cases, and so you know just just taking that that mindset, uh, I think has been you know pretty pretty special. And 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 look, I mean, for me, you know, this the single biggest lesson learned is is the fact that this is a, a holistic a program um, that we are trying to drive a, a business outcome. And although technology is very important, having the clear vision of what you're trying to achieve and, and sticking with that and then having the executive sponsorship has, has been critically important. I mean, as you know, Steve, um, the, the, you know, we've had like many, many um, conversations around regulatory, regulatory strategy, engaging with regulators, being able to kind of uh, walk them through our journey talk them through the, the PVQMS, how that's uh, an integral part of the program. I mean, I think that's been critically important. The organizational readiness and being able to bring the teams uh, along, helping them understand why we're doing this and how their jobs uh, you know, will change. Um, obviously, you touched on, on the productivity numbers and, and you know, the substantial benefits being able to achieve from that. And so being able to engage then in, in data-driven conversations with, with BPOs uh, has obviously also been critically important. And, and then the other part is just the, um, the deep safety expertise um, that, that we've collectively been able to bring. So, you know, I think Deloitte has certainly brought uh, a lot of expertise in that, in that area. Obviously, Sanofi too, not just in the understanding of, of how a case gets processed, um, but, but with, with knowledge of how safety platforms are, are built. And, and so, you know, ultimately having partners that, that can bring these attributes and, and scale uh, to the table, I think has, has enabled uh, the successful, uh, successful journey. Um, Amanda, any, any thoughts there? Any additional thoughts or Steve? Maybe just, I mean, you, you hit on, I think, most of them, but um, maybe just a couple on the org readiness and, um, and the vendor engagement. I mean, I know with all large programs, we all we all say and we kind of tick a box for change management org readiness, but it can't really, it can't be understated with a program like this. And it's something that, um, you know, between both Deloitte and Sanofi recognize the importance of, and it, and it truly has, I think Steve and Anand, you both said it, this has been a program that the organization Everyone is very excited down from affiliates up to various other levels of leadership within within both Anand and Steve's organizations are want to be a part of. 
Um, and so I, it, that sh really cannot be underestimated. And same thing with the vendor engagement, um, both Anand and Steve highlighted, you know, the critical piece that they, the role that they play here to achieve savings. And I think helping the data-driven conversation, like you said, Glenn, where a lot of times these automation conversations are approached, well, I have to have 100% no touch or no touch automation. And there's a, there's a good use case for that, but there's actually also a lot of savings um, in cases, if you've optimized correctly, um, that maybe have limited touch. So while there is a, a, a huge value in no touch and we drive towards that eventually, um, there's also a lot of savings that can be realized with, with limited touch. And so having the vendors be communicated to at the right time with the right messaging um, and, and sharing those data-driven conversations has also been extremely impactful. Yep, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Team, are you okay? I'm just in the interest of time. We've we've about five minutes left. I want to continue with the questions, if that's okay. Um, so next question is case validity and, and dupe search. Has that been automated and or does it uh, need human intervention? Maybe I'll just take that real quick. It's been yeah. automated. Uh, sometimes the machines cannot make the final adjudication and therefore it goes to uh, an, an expert for for review, but otherwise it's 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 automated along with you know kind of earlier parts of the process. Um, next question: In the beginning, you mentioned traditional database would be eliminated. Does this mean overriding existing Argus kind of database? Can you please describe that? Our vision is that an end-to-end -end automated safety platform um, will eliminate the need for a traditional database. Now with with Sanofi. I mean, obviously, we um, where we're, we sort of have a, an integration point by which the upfront processing is done um, by Convert Child Safety, and it's dropped in to to Argus. Um, but certainly, Deloitte's vision and our goal is to complete the end-to-end -end automation and eliminate the database. Um, let me just. What kind of metrics enhancements are you looking for to begin uh, ramping down 100% uh, inline QC? And would that drive up your retrospective QA review? Um, Good question. Uh, I think I think we'll ha uh, we'll have to see. We're looking for uh, a comfort level in in what feels as the machine you know as close to 100% accurate as it can be um, that will get us to that comfort level. And I think you know we're seeing a lot of the fields are very consistent, but we are do seeing you know it is a learning process, and there are certain fields where where um, uh, the machine may get right 80% or 90%, but there are fields, but but there are errors or the machine does sometimes make a mistake and uh, until we have a full understanding of that and we we can move to a full inline we can well we're not going to be comfortable moving the inline qc uh, at, at until we're and i think deloitte would probably agree with that you know we, we are learning as much as the machine is on how to do this process and when we're more comfortable with it then we'll, we'll we'll lower it down and yeah that probably would result in a more retrospective uh, increase in retrospective QA review, which yeah. we still do anyway. And, and the other thing, which I mean, if I may, Steve, the benefits that we're seeing with the automation, I mean, even with the 100% QC, far outweigh, yeah. uh, you know, kind of taking any risks. So, so like for right now, it's an absolute no brainer to, to yeah. continue with the 100% the QC and the automation because the benefit is substantial. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Amanda, let me, uh, question here. Could you explain, uh, uh, please explain how the career path has changed for PD professionals and how mm, great <laughs> AI configurations and programming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, just very much like, you know, today there's obviously technical and business career path. I'll speak a little bit more to the business because we're familiar with, but as you can see, and, and, and Steve did a great job of saying this, we really, this will move the industry to being more of, of a exception or anomaly based oversight versus, you know, uh, being like, I love Lucy taking things off the line. Each case gets treated the same. And so the, the skill sets that are needed from a talent perspective, um, start to shift to be a skill set that can oversee versus necessarily just be transactional doers. Um, skill sets that can identify, um, help machines identify patterns. Well, for example, if a case got brought to a human user as anomalous, um, you know, being able to confirm that anomaly or say, nope, that's expected as per pattern. So you can see that shift from a, a transactional doing 
to being really strategic in an oversight perspective. Great. Um, so question for Deloitte. You mentioned you started about seven years ago. How many pharma companies are using CHS and are you fully operational end to end? Uh, we have several pharma companies that are using uh, CHS and, and different modules. And um, the third release, uh, which we're in development right now, which we will go live with sort of mid next year, will we'll complete the end to end. So we're not live with end to end. We're back 50 percent there. Um, this third release will, will complete that. Um, the next question is, has this type of case processing been audited internally? And I will, I'll let Steve or Anna answer that. And have there been any findings? So we've been we've been partnering, I'll first say we've partnered with our quality groups, both on the clinical on the PV side and the IT side uh, have been a big part of this process. Um, we have we have had one audit that's looked at it. We have a big one coming up, and that's one of the big milestones we do have. And we're, there's a lot of thinking about how we manage manage an automated system and an audit is, is, a, is a big topic of conversation and, and uh, one of those big milestones we're still going to go through. Great. Thank you. Uh, how much time is, is taking for complete end-to-end -end case processing after automation? And is this greater than human case processing time? Uh, so I don't know if we have specific numbers, but it's it's significantly reduced versus human case processing time. I mean, we shared a slide earlier, which shows, I don't know, is it like a 70% reduction? 50, 60, 70, something, something like that? 50, 50 plus. I would say like it's taking probably anywhere from 20 to at, at the low end to 40 minutes to finish a case sometimes. Okay, in the art of state of it. I know we're running short on time, but I think one of, one of the things we didn't get, have time to get into was one of the unanticipated benefits that we saw was actually that we had hoped and we actually saw it is that the downstream work in Argus, so still traditional work that happens in Argus, that was actually, and Steve, feel free to chime in or correct me, but that that work was actually happening more quickly for Artemis cases. So the actual end to end time was actually shrinking, not just from the automation, but because of the quality and, and some of the efficiencies that got brought to the end to end process. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely true. So there are a bunch of other questions, but we are running out of time. Um, so maybe just a couple of things. One, uh, the webinar and the recording, I think, will be shared with participants. I think there's a survey that goes out as well after this. And so uh, if you have additional follow-ups or additional questions, you know, certainly all of us are, are happy to answer those questions. And, and I'll, I'll try and get the list of questions that are in this, uh, that are already listed here and try and get answers back out to folks. Um, so certainly appreciate everybody's participation. Hopefully it was really informative. Certainly wanna thank uh, our partners, uh, Steve Kuski and Anna Dramanathan and obviously World Drug Safety Congress as well, and Amanda Bowles uh, for her leadership. I thought this was very insightful and very interesting, so appreciate your time. Thanks so much, all. Thank you very much for attending. And then, uh, as Glenn mentioned, the event World Drug Safety Congress Americas will be taken in person in Boston, October 20 and the 21st, and our next webinar will be May 11th. Hope to see you there, and thank you very much for your participation. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.